Welcome back, everybody. I'm here on page 11 of the chapter one lecture note outlines, and we're gonna continue our lessons with today learning about unit conversion. As you might expect, unit conversion involves taking a measurement that has a specific magnitude and a unit label and transforming it or converting it into a different unit. And because we use many different types of measurements in chemistry, unit conversion turns out to be an essential skill. We will learn a systematic and streamlined method called dimensional analysis to help minimize any frustrations or difficulties in converting between different units. Because we use dimensional analysis so extensively through the entire course, I want to make sure that at the very beginning we get a really solid grounding in the method. In order to do that, I'm going to teach you first about some terminology that we use in dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis changes a given unit into a desired unit by multiplying the given unit by a ratio. And this ratio, we give a specific name. It's called a conversion factor. So the process of dimensional analysis starts with some given unit, and we know we need to go to some desired unit. To do so, we use a conversion factor. Because we start with our given unit, I usually call that our starting point. And because we're ending with some desired unit, I usually call that the destination that we're going to. One of the tricks that you will learn throughout this course is looking at problems and dividing those problems up into given units, conversion factors, and desired units. That's one of the main skills I hope to teach you during this course because it will make solving these types of problems very easy for you. To try to help explain how conversion factors change given units into desired units, the first thing that I want to show you is a simplified form of this process using symbols that I've shown here below. Taking a look at this situation, I'm converting the circle unit into the, say, rectangle unit, and to do so, I have to use the conversion factor, which is shown here in the middle. For a ratio to function as a conversion factor, it needs to meet two requirements. The first requirement for a conversion factor is that it needs to be true. That means there needs to be some definition or some other way to verify that the ratio is correct. So for example, if one circle does in fact equal one rectangle, this conversion factor is true and therefore we can use it. If you're not sure if a conversion factor is valid or true, you can always write it down as an equality like I've done here and look at both sides, checking to make sure that that makes sense. So for example, if I had one year equals 365 days, that's true and I can use that ratio as a conversion factor. Now, if I reversed this and wrote down 365 years equals one day, that is definitely not true, and I wouldn't be able to use this as a conversion factor. The second requirement for conversion factors is that they need to have the unit placement correct. We need to have the right units in the top and bottom positions. Specifically, we have to have our destination unit, the one we're converting into, in the top position. We often call this top position the numerator from mathematics. In the bottom position, otherwise known as the denominator, we have to have the same unit as the starting point. So we have the destination unit in the top position and the starting unit in the bottom position. So as long as our conversion factor is used in this way and is true, it's going to allow us to convert a given unit into a desired unit. Frequently, it's necessary to use multiple conversion factors in order to change a given unit into a desired unit. This happens when we don't have a direct conversion factor between the given unit and the desired unit, but we do have intermediate conversion factors that allow us to bridge the gap. If we extend our shape analogy, suppose we needed to convert circles into triangles, but we didn't have a direct conversion factor to accomplish that. What would we need? Well, we would need some intermediate conversion factors. So for example, suppose we knew that circles could be converted into squares by this relationship, and we also knew that squares could be converted into triangles by this relationship. Using the first conversion factor, we would transform circles into squares. We could then immediately place the next conversion factor that converts squares into triangles. 
This works because the unit circles cancels with circles and squares cancels with squares, leaving us with triangles as a result. Typically, we have a starting point that is not a ratio. For example, circles is just circles. It's not circles over squares. But occasionally, we also need to convert ratios into other ratios or single units themselves. When that happens, our starting point itself is a ratio. This doesn't change the process by which units are canceled and converted into other units. We just have to do a little bit more analysis. So for example here, let's try to cancel out the units that are the same. Notice that cats would cross cancel with cats and dogs would cross cancel with dogs. This would leave us the ratio of frogs to mice. So now that we've learned the basics of dimensional analysis, let's go to the next page, learn a little bit more about conversion factors with numerical values, and then do some examples. At the top here of page 12 in the lecture note outline, I have a section that I have been meaning to delete and haven't gotten around to doing that yet. So actually this example with the shapes uh, it's not it's not very useful, so we're going to cross this part out, and we're actually just going to go down here to the section on conversion factors and start from there. So as I mentioned on the previous page, conversion factors are ratios or fractions whose numerator and denominator are equal to the same thing. So they're essentially the same quantity expressed in different units. So here are some examples of other conversion factors. One really important feature of conversion factors is we can write them down with the numerator and denominator in either position. This allows us to control how we use the conversion factor in transforming a given unit into a desired unit that we're looking for. Now, a really common question we get at this phase or soon is what conversion factors do I need to know? Which ones do I have to memorize? Where should I look them up if I don't have them, etc. So let's go over that really quick. First, what are the conversion factors that you need to know and or memorize? I would say the conversion factors that you would know would be things we would assume are commonly known, such as how many minutes there are in an hour or days in a week or dozen means 12, that kind of thing. Other conversion factors you might not already know, but you should learn. That would definitely include the metric system. The metric system is the only one that we would expect you really to memorize that you don't already know. For other conversion factors, we will provide them for you to look up in a table. This table of common conversion factors can be printed from Canvas. Also, if you have the textbook, you can look at the same table in there. It's on page 31, I believe, and it's labeled table 1-4. When you're in the lab, it's very important for you to realize you can look up the conversion factors in the experimental. We provide the specific conversion factors that you will need for that experiment in the manual. To make sure that you always get consistent results that match the results we're expecting, it's important that you use the tables that we're providing rather than looking up conversions on the internet, which are sometimes rounded off to values that are not precise or slightly different than the ones we're using. So now that that's out of the way, let's try some examples. In this first example, we have a length of rope that is 57.63 centimeters. That's a metric unit. We're being asked, what is the length of rope in inches? So we're given the unit of centimeters and the desired unit is inches. We need to have a conversion factor that expresses the relationship between centimeters and inches in order to perform this conversion. If you look this conversion factor up in the table on Canvas or in your textbook, you'll find that 2.5 centimeters equals one inch. Let's set up our dimensional analysis with the starting point. That's our 57.63 centimeters. Next, we'll place the conversion factor, which has inches on the top, that's our destination, and centimeters on the bottom, that's our origin. Next, we just need to fill in the numerical values for those units. Notice that it's 2.54 centimeters for every one inch. So we write the 2.54 on the bottom and the one at the top. Now we have to use our calculator to compute the result. On your calculator, you would type in 57.63 and then multiply that by one. And then you can hit the equal sign and divide by 2.54 to give you the calculated value. 
If you need some tips on how to actually do this with your particular calculator, or you just need a little bit more reinforcement on this, please let me know. I'd be happy to sit down in office hours and go over it step by step with you on several examples. That way you can get really confident with doing this. In the meantime, type this into your calculator and see what result you get. When you unpause the video, I'm going to show you my answer. The calculated value is 22.6889 inches. This value needs to be rounded to the correct number of significant figures because we're dealing with a measurement. Now, what number of significant figures do we use? Notice our starting point here has four significant figures. That's the measurement. And then we have the conversion factors with one inch over 2.54 centimeters. Do we use the four significant figures from the measurement, one significant figure from inches, or three significant figures from centimeters? It turns out that our answer must have four significant figures in it because the conversion factor of inches to centimeters is a defined value. That means it has an infinite number of significant figures because it is not estimated. Because we're doing a multiplication here, we use the least sig figs rule, which says that we look at the term with the least number of significant figures. 57.63 has four sig figs, and the conversion factor has an infinite number of sig figs. That means our answer should also have four significant figures. When we round this, we get 22.69 inches. So if you got that right, great job. Let's try another example. What is the mass in grams of a person that is 115 pounds? Our starting point here is 115 pounds, and we need a conversion factor that has the units pounds on the bottom and grams at the top. If you look at the common conversions table from Canvas, you'll find that there are 453.6 grams in one pound. You'll also see that this conversion factor is not known exactly. It is only known with four significant figures on either side. So when we're completing our conversion factor here, we have 1.000 next to the unit's pounds at the bottom, and we have 453.6 next to the grams unit at the top. We can compute this with our calculator by multiplying 115 by 453.6 grams, and then dividing by one. The calculated value is a 52164. Now we need to do a significant figures analysis and rounding operation. Notice the first term here has three significant figures, and our conversion factor has four significant figures. That means our answer needs to be rounded to three significant figures. Looking to the right-hand side of the third significant figure, we see a six. That means we are rounding up. That means we round this value to 52200. So if you got that one right, great job. Let's go to the next page and try a few more examples. We're gonna start off this page with a multi-step dimensional analysis. So we're going to need multiple conversion factors in order to arrive at the desired unit. What I would like you to do first is pause the video and try to identify as many of the conversion factors that you can find reading through the sentence and any others that you might find useful when you're solving this problem. After you unpause the video, we'll discuss how to put all this together and arrive at a solution. So reading through the sentence, we see a factory packages 55 dozen eggs in one hour. We see the word eggs in one hour there, and that tells us we're dealing with a conversion factor. This allows us to convert hours into dozen eggs or dozen eggs into hours. So that's one of our conversion factors, but notice here we're also dealing with time. On the one hand, we see a conversion factor that's expressed in hours, but on the other side, we're given some information in minutes. That means at some stage, we're probably gonna have to convert minutes into hours. We know that 60 minutes equals one hour, so let's have that as one of our conversion factors. Now, what other conversion factors might we find? Well, notice here in the beginning that we're referring to dozen eggs, but on the right-hand side in the second part of the sentence, we see we're just talking about eggs themselves, not dozens of eggs. So at some point, we're probably gonna need to convert a dozen into eggs. So let's use that conversion factor as well. So we have three conversion factors written down. What we need now is a starting point. The problem statement says, how many eggs do they package in 131 minutes? So what we're being asked for here is how many eggs, and we want to know how many eggs given the fact that we have 131 minutes. So 131 minutes is our starting point. 
So pause the video and see if you can put together the dimensional analysis, and when you unpause the video, I'll show you my solution. In the first step, we're going to convert 131 minutes into hours. By using the conversion factor, one hour is equal to 60 minutes. We have to do this step first because the conversion factor, which transforms time into a dozen eggs, has hours in the conversion factor rather than minutes. So in order to use that conversion factor, we have to transform minutes into hours. Once we've done that, now we can convert into dozen eggs from hours. Finally, we can convert from dozen eggs into eggs by using the final conversion factor that expresses the relationship between dozen and 12. Over the three steps, we can see how the units cancel. First, minutes cancels, followed by hours, and followed by dozen eggs. This leaves us with eggs at the end. On your calculator, you take 131 minutes, divide it by 60, and then hit the equal sign. You would multiply that by 55, hit the equal sign, and then multiply that by 12. Finally, hitting the equal sign to give you 1,441 eggs. Now, the question is, is what about significant figures? We have to think here what's defined and what's measured. Anything that's defined has an infinite number of significant figures, unless we're told otherwise, and anything that's measured has a limited number of significant figures. So I would say that 131 minutes is a measurement, so that's going to have three significant figures. The conversion factor hours to minutes is a definition. It's exactly that. So we would have an infinite number of significant figures for that. Then we have 55 dozen eggs per hour. That is also a measurement that someone would have to take to establish it, so there's going to be error involved. I would say that has two significant figures. And then we have 12 eggs per dozen. That's a defined value, so it's an infinite number of significant figures. So looking at all of this, considering it's a multiplication, how many significant figures should our answer be rounded to? Well, that's correct, two significant figures. When we round 1441 to two significant figures, we're rounding down and we get 1400 eggs. So if you got that right, great job. All right, now that we've done that first example, let's move on to the second one, letter D. An eight meter rod has what length in inches? For this one, we're going to need to convert meters, which is the metric system, to an English unit, inches. To do that, the easiest conversion factor for us to use, probably the best one also, is the well-known conversion between centimeters and inches, which we used on the previous page. It's a defined value and has an infinite number of significant figures, which is why it's a good conversion factor. The definition is 2.54 centimeters equals one inch. Now, of course, we're not given the starting point in centimeters, we're given the starting point in meters. That means we're going to need to convert meters first into centimeters and then into inches. So let's get started setting up the dimensional analysis. We're gonna start with our 8.00 meters and we're multiplying that by a conversion factor that transforms meters into centimeters. So we have meters at the bottom and centimeters at the top. Let's leave the values blank here for now and we'll talk about them in a second. Now let's use the next conversion factor. We have to transform centimeters into inches. So in this second conversion factor, we need to have centimeters at the bottom and inches at the top. We can check that we have the correct series of steps here with the units in the right places just by looking at the units and how they cancel. Notice that meters would cancel with meters, centimeters with centimeters, and we would be left with inches, the desired unit, at the end. Now we just need to fill in the correct values for each of the conversion factors. As we know, 2.54 centimeters equals one inch, so let's put those values in in that second conversion factor now. Now, what about the metric conversion? Remember, the metric conversion table is something that you're responsible to know, so you need to know what the values are for the metric prefixes. Here, the metric prefix that we need to know the value for is the letter C. Remember, C stands for centi, and if you can remember that there are 100 cents in $1, you can remember what the letter C stands for. C stands for 0 0.01. So if I have one centimeter, that equals 0 0.01 meters. Notice that I've just replaced the letter C with its value in the denominator where the letter is missing. If you need a quick review for how the metric prefixes work, 
go back to the previous video where I demonstrate how to use these letters and how to replace them with their values. Now that we have all of the conversion factors set up correctly, we just need to get the calculated value and then round to the right number of significant figures. So while the calculated value is 314.96 meters, we need to round this to three significant figures. That's because our measurement has three significant figures and the metric conversion factor is exact. So is the English conversion factor between inches and centimeters. So if we round this to three significant figures, we get 315 meters. Let's try another example. What is the mass in kilograms of an object whose mass is 50 micrograms? So for this one, we're going to stay within the metric system. So we can use all of the conversion factors that we know after learning the metric prefixes. The way I like to use the metric system is to avoid putting multiple metric prefixes in one conversion factor. Rather, I like to go from one metric prefix to the unit without a metric prefix and then to the second metric prefix. So in this case, we could go from micrograms to grams, that one doesn't have a metric prefix, and then finally to kilograms. In this way, I don't have to do any mathematics to combine the conversion factors. So to set this up, let's start with our 50 micrograms, and then we're gonna have the first conversion factor transforming micrograms into grams. So we have micrograms on the bottom and grams at the top. The next conversion factor is going to convert that grams unit into kilograms. That's our final destination. So we have grams at the bottom and kilograms at the top. Now we can go ahead and complete our dimensional analysis by filling in the values for the metric prefixes that are missing. So for example, we see the metric prefix micro down here. What's the value for micro? That's correct, it's 10 to the minus six power. So we put that value in the top position next to the unit gram because it doesn't have the metric prefix in front of it. We need the value there. In the second term, we have the metric prefix K. We know that K stands for 10 to the third power. So let's write 10 to the third power next to gram where we're missing that letter K. Now we just look at our conversion factors and we put a one next to each of the already present metric prefixes and we have our conversion factors all set up and ready to go. So we take our 50 and we multiply it by 10 to the negative six power, making sure you have that 10 to the minus six in parentheses. If you don't do that, you might not get the correct value. After you do that multiplication, hit the equal sign and then divide again by 10 to the third power, placing that 10 to the third power in parentheses. Now you should have the calculated value on your calculator and you'll see a lot of zeros and then a five. This is a perfect candidate for scientific notation and when we write it down with two significant figures, that's based on our measurement having two sig figs, then we get 5.0 times 10 to the negative eighth power, that's in kilograms. Now this last example here, letter F, I've also been meaning to take that out of the lecture notes for a little while and just haven't gotten quite around to that yet. So let's actually skip over this one and go on to the next page. In chemistry, we frequently also need to convert between different units of temperature. We're not going to be using dimensional analysis to convert between different units of temperature. Instead, we're gonna use some formulas to help us with this process. The first set of temperature conversions that I want you to learn about is the conversion between Celsius and Kelvin. Kelvin is a universal temperature scale and we use it quite a bit, a little later in the course. For now, know that if you want to find Kelvin from degrees Celsius, you would add 273.15 to your degrees Celsius measurement to get the value in Kelvin. If you wanted to go backwards, say you wanted to get degrees Celsius and all you had was Kelvin, you would subtract 273.15 from Kelvin to get degrees Celsius. Now let's talk about the conversion between Fahrenheit and Celsius. If we wanna have degrees Celsius and we currently have our measurement in degrees Fahrenheit, we would take the fraction 5 ninths and multiply it by degrees Fahrenheit minus 32. If we wanted degrees Fahrenheit and we had degrees Celsius on the other hand, what we would do is multiply nine over five by degrees Celsius and then add 32. Let's try a few examples of these conversions below. Suppose the temperature is 31 degrees Celsius. 
let's try to express this temperature in Kelvin and then degrees Fahrenheit. For Kelvin, we just take the 31 degrees Celsius and we add 273.15. Because we're doing addition, we have to cut off the value here in the ones position because our measurement, 31 degrees Celsius, is only expressed out to that precision. Therefore, when we round this, we get a 304 Kelvin. For the Fahrenheit conversion, we take 9 fifths and we multiply that by 31 degrees Celsius. Then we add 32. The calculated value for this conversion is 87.8 degrees Fahrenheit, but we have to round it to two significant figures. We round it to two significant figures because the measurement only has two sig figs in it. The other values here are mathematically exact. 9 over 5 is an exact number and has an infinite number of significant figures. Also, we're adding 32 here. It turns out that's also an exact number as well. There's no error involved in it. So our sig figs is based here entirely on the measurement. So we get 88 degrees Fahrenheit. If you need additional practice for temperature conversions, there are several in the problem set and also down here in these examples going between degrees Celsius and Fahrenheit. Now, the next section in the chapter one lecture note outline is percent error. We're not actually teaching percent error in this part of the course anymore, so we're gonna skip over those sections. And with that, we're concluding the chapter one lecture note outline. So congratulations, that's the first part of unit one. Uh, I hope you're doing well, and I will see you in the next lesson. Take care.